Hello everyone and welcome to Monday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling New Show. Now I know what you're thinking. Got some new products on the back wall and yeah. These are companies I've been working closely with over the past couple of days. Uh, Benelin produce a wonderful medicine for, for, for chesty coughs. We've got Lemsip, standard everyone knows that, and Albus Inhaler Nasal Stick. Unbelievable quality. Uh, link down in the description for, for none of those products at all. So much to talk about today. What a weekend of racing. Giro Rosa. Terreno Adriatico, Tour de France, and then in all that, so many subplots going off. It's There's so much to talk about. But before we get into the news, thank you, each and every one of you that has taken the time to subscribe to the channel. If you've not done already, literally cost you nothing other than the energy expenditure from going subscribe. That's it. Just hit that subscribe button. It would do the channel the world of good and it would feed my ego no end. Please, thank you. All right, first up, let's head over to Italy for the first three stages of the Giro Rosa. So the Giro Rosa started on Friday with a team time trial, and unsurprisingly, it was a team of Mitchelton Scott with race favourite Annemiek van Vluten, who set the early benchmark for the other teams to beat. A time was set of 20 minutes and 10 seconds. Now, Trek Segafredo managed to beat that time set by Mitchelton Scott by five seconds, giving them the lead with only one team remaining out on the road, which was Bowles Dolmans. Although Bowles Dolmans managed to keep all six riders together to the line, it's obviously the fourth rider across the line on which the time stops, and unfortunately for them, they crossed the line three seconds slower, handing the victory to Trek Segafredo, giving Elisa Longo Borghini the first Malio Rosa of 2020, and not only that, the first of her career. Now, stage two was a lumpy affair with over 3,000 meters of climbing in the Tuscan Hills, which took in parts of the gravel roads on the Strada Bianchi. Annemiek van Vluten took the race to the rest of the riders on the only classified climb of the day, attacking hard, and the only rider able to stay with her was Utrup Ludwig. But unfortunately, the pace of Annemiek van Vluten was even too much for Cecily, as she also eventually got dropped. But it wasn't plain sailing for the road race champion as she came down on some deep gravel on that rough climb. But it wasn't enough to stop her as she soloed her way to victory, putting herself in the Malio Rosa by 1 minute and 18 seconds ahead of second place, as they headed into stage three. Now, stage three looked on the profile as a very hard day to begin with, and then it looked essentially like a nice leisurely ride down to the finish on some much flatter terrain. But what the profile didn't show you was the horrid 500 meter kick up towards the line. Essentially, it was a wall the riders faced. And clearly, the riders were concerned with this kick towards the line as no breakaway went up the road and the peloton rode together the whole way to the finish. Even the chances of crosswinds across the open fields weren't enough to separate the peloton and it was all down to that kick up to the line. Alisa Longo Borghini started the proceedings with a solid attack at the foot and a small group of five riders got away from the rest of the peloton and those five riders were eventually whittled down to two riders fighting it out for victory in Mariana Voss and Cecilia Utrub Ludwig again. And it was the experienced Voss who showed her class and form by taking the victory. In the overall general classification, after stage three of the Giro Rosa, Annemiek van Vluten still leads by 1 minute and 22 seconds ahead of her fellow Dutch rider, Anna van der Breggen, with Mariana Voss now moving into the top 10 after Sunday's victory. Sticking in Italy and heading over to the Torino Adriatico, prior to the weekend, the blue jersey had been ripped from the arms of Michael Woods by Simon Yates, who took an emphatic victory on stage five with a devastating attack showing his form is coming. He took the stage victory ahead of G and Rafa Micah, and Yates secured that blue jersey by 16 seconds ahead of Micah. And after that solid ride from G, he moves up into third place, only 39 seconds behind Yates now. Stage six finally saw the riders arriving at the Adriatic coast. And this one on the profile looked like it should be ending in a bunch sprint. With six riders up the road, the sprint teams kept the time gap in check, but as soon as they found out that Carl Friedrich Hagen was in that break, they would work hard to pull that slippery little fish back. They knew if he was out in that break, it was always gonna stay away. What a solid rider. With 13K to go, it was all back together and the sprint was on. Surely this was set up for another ACK attack. Pa Pascal Ackerman, pa Pascal Ackerman sprint win. But anyway, it wasn't. 
it was Tim Malia from Alpes in Phoenix who took the victory ahead of Ackerman and a very, he must be getting so frustrated, a very frustrated Fernando Gaviria. Stage seven's profile looked spicy for a breakaway to stay away today. And one rider who seems to be riding himself into a bit of form now is Mathieu van der Bill. He made it into a 14 man break. Now with just over 20K to go, six riders found themselves at the sharp end. And again, included in that group was a certain Mr. Van der Bill. Mathieu Fabro put in a bit of a solo attack. He managed to get 26 seconds on this group. But Mathieu van der Bill went all Amstel Gold on their ass, catching that lone breakaway and putting in a bit of time into them all just for good measure. The GC riders weren't that far behind in the end. They were around 10 to 15 seconds away. But hey, watch out boys. His form's coming. I told you, it's all going off. And what's interesting the most is one, seeing Simon Yates' form starting to come. Two, seeing G's form starting to come now. And I bet, we'll get into this later, that Team Ineos are looking over there in Italy and going, maybe we should have kept G in this Tour de France team. As I say, we'll talk about that shortly. But also Mathieu van der Poel, his form's starting to come. He's been relatively quiet. All eyes have been on Remco Evenepoel up until his crash. And while Van Aar, you're looking at these two riders thinking, that's where all the attention is. That's where all this, this, this young spunk is getting thrown around everywhere at the minute. However, Mathieu van der Poel has been going about his business nice and quietly, not pulling any trees up too soon. And now, now, you can tell his form's coming just in time for the clap, not for the spring classics, obviously, but for the, the autumn, the autumnal classics. All right, let's turn our attention across to the Tour de France. Oh my God, what a weekend of racing. I wish they'd put these stages midweek so I could make videos about them there and then. Cracking few days of racing. So let's head back to Saturday now, stage 14. Now, if you happen to tune into this stage partway through, you'd think you were watching Bora Hansgrohe deciding that they wanted a piece of GC action. They once again ripped the race apart from the start on what looked like it should be a relatively, and I say that, relatively, should have been a relatively easy stage. There was enough climbs in there to stop it being a full-on bunch sprint, but there was also not enough climbing in there to make it a GC affair. So it was perfect for a breakaway had Bora Hansgrohe allowed a breakaway to go up the road. Bora's plan once again was to try and shake off Deconi Quickstep and Sam Bennett so they could try and eat into that deficit Sagan has on that green jersey. And the plan worked a treat. Bennett got dropped and they picked up third place at that intermediate sprint and fourth place. And at 77 kilometers to go, Deconi Quickstep stopped trying to chase the main group. Sagan had got his own way so it was now up to him to make sure he took the sprint victory. Or at least he bloody should have after all that hard work his team had put in. But alas, it was a day for one of those stupid, aimless, random attacks that goes away within the last five kilometers and always gets brought back. Apart from this one. It was set up wonderfully by teammate Tij Banu and Soren Kra Anderson took his chances with a little zest whilst everybody else was looking at each other and boom. He only went and bloody won it. Sagan so eventually come over the line fourth overall. Again, taking valuable points off of Sam Bennett in that hunt for that green jersey. Stage 15 and it was back to the hunt for the yellow jersey. Early in the stage, Colombian champion Sergio Higuita took a massive shoot, which would eventually see him retire after Bobby Ungles swung out from the pace line and caught the Colombian's front wheel, sending him crashing to the ground hard. And he wouldn't be the only Colombian feeling like he'd been banged up today. Nairo Quintana was the first to crack on the final summit of the day. And eventually he was followed by, never thought I'd say this, Egan Bernal. And with Egan Bernal getting dropped, any chances that Team Ineos Grenadiers had of GC success went up in flames as he went backwards and everybody else went forwards. The stage victory was fought out between Pogacar and Rodlich, and it was the younger of the two Slovenians taking the victory and with it taking another four seconds out of that leader. So as you can see here on the left hand side, this is the standings prior to stage 15 starting. Primoz Rodlich still in the lead, 44 seconds ahead of Pogacar, Egan Bernal in third place, 59 seconds behind Rigoberto Oran in fourth, Nairo Quintana fifth, Miguel Angel Lopez sixth, four Colombians in the top six, unbelievable. Adam Yates in seventh, one minute 42 behind, Mikhail Lander in eighth, and Richie Port there in ninth, 
two minutes and six. And as you can see on the right hand side, this is how it looks now. Clearly the top two are having a race of their own. We'll talk about that shortly, but again, Tajit Pogacar taking another four seconds out of Primoz Roglic. Now up into third is Rigoberto Aran. Miguel Angel Lopez bunny hops two places into fourth place. He's now a minute and 45 behind the leaders. Adam Yates moving himself up into fifth place. This rider who isn't riding for GC, who wanted stage wins, has now, by the looks of it, changed his priorities. He's now two minutes and three behind the leader. But more importantly, he's only 29 seconds off of that third spot on the podium. But behind him, a rider that's looking better and better as this tour goes on. 10 seconds behind Yatesy is Richie Poor up into sixth place. And as you can see, the two Colombians, Nairo Quintana and Egan Bernal, the two biggest losers from the weekend. Nairo Quintana dropping himself down into ninth. Egan Bernal down in 13th. Stage 15 was just unbelievable. I don't even know where to start with it. There's so many talking points from that stage that... Right, let's start with Egan Bernal. He lost some big time on yesterday's stage. 7 minutes and 20 seconds behind the race winner, Tajet Pogacar. Egan Bernal came over the line in a group with Wout van Aert. Bearing in mind that Wout van Aert had been absolutely smashing himself to bits on the base of that climb to put his team in the right position. So he was wasted. He was done. And Egan Bernal came over the line with him. That just shows you what an issue and what a day Egan Bernal had. And it wasn't a good day in the slightest. He said in race interviews afterwards that he just felt empty, that he didn't have any strength. And that could be down to a million and one things. Dare I say. Covid. I mean, don't forget, he had those tests last week. Clearly, they must have come back negative because he'd been allowed to race. But what was if all of a sudden, oh, we test him again just to be on the safe side. And actually, yeah, he does have it. So we need to pull him out now. And now you've got to look at that Team Ineos Grenadiers team and question it and say, what would have happened if Froomey was in there? What would have happened if G was in there? And Bradley Wiggins over on Eurosport was pulling no punches with his opinion on Dave Brailsford's selection of this team. I think that you take your big players to races like that. Um, the same as Mark Cavendish last year when, when Dimension Data didn't take him to the Tour. I think, you know, just their presence at the dinner table, their presence on the flat stages in the lineup, particularly Geraint. I can't see Geraint not being in the same position as someone like Tom Dumoulin at the moment. You know, I just, I can, I, I can see him riding in that style if he chose to. With Bernal falling away, I could still see Geraint there in a, in a sort of sim similar place to where Richie Port is. Geraint not on form will probably be where Richie Port is at the moment. Geraint on form will be challenged to win the race. I think we didn't realise quite when we commented on it back at the start just how little input they had into their own selections. I kind of bigged up the team and Dave was saying that probably they were just as much as part of the decision as Dave and they probably chose to. It's clearly the other way round and they're all a bit pissed off now. I guess, I guess over the next couple of weeks, we'll find out exactly what's going off there. But, the, yeah, we look back now to that selection moment when Egan Bernal was selected for the tour. They brought in Carapaz. Froomey was going to the Vuelta. And G was targeting the Giro. Now, when we look at G over on uh, the Treno Adriatico, you can see his form starting to develop a little bit. And you can't help thinking potentially that form might have come a little sooner had he been in the Tour de France. Like we're talking about Geraint Thomas here, a winner of the Tour de France, one of the most experienced GC riders in the world tour. Like Wiggins said, even if he's not on form, he's still capable of being there or thereabouts. And they kind of just, they threw all their eggs into one basket with Egan Bernal in the hope that, I don't know, what, Carapaz was going to find some form and all of a sudden, yes, He's won a Grand Tour, but come on, the Tour de France is another level. It's another level. And neither him or Bernal clearly weren't ready for it. But what is the reason Egan Bernal fell off a cliff so bad? Especially when you look back to Friday, I think it was, when he, he got dropped, but he was saying, I felt good. I was putting out some of the best numbers I've ever put out. I feel good. Almost like he wasn't disappointed because he felt good, but he'd still got dropped. And then Sunday... 
he clearly wasn't putting out good numbers at all, but how can he have fallen off a cliff so badly? I know people say anything can happen in the Tour de France, but it doesn't often happen like that. You you kind of start to see, and I'm talking a big cliff, like seven minutes is a big cliff for a rider of his stature, the rider who won the Tour de France last year. Right, so we're not talking, uh, the likes of Richie Port. if he fell off a cliff on, on, on Sunday, you'd have gone, kind of expected it anyway. But with Egan Bernal, you expect him to lose 10 seconds, lose 20 seconds, lose 30 seconds, and you're like, ooh, that's, that's a lot of time. But to capitulate the way he did was just, there must be, there must be a reason behind it. He can't have just got his fuel in wrong. Or, or the, the back injury is plaguing him worse than we anticipated. Unless that is the I don't know. Leave your comments down below and let me know what you think the issue is. Is it, is it the team dynamic? Is there something going on at Ineos that's affecting the way he's riding? I don't know. It'd be interesting to get your thoughts though. Leave them down below. Now, if Egan Bernal dropping out of GC contention like a stone, it creates this whole new dynamic within the GC competition. You've got... The two Slovenians at the top, fighting for victory. I don't think anybody's getting anywhere near them. So you've got Rodlich fighting against Pogacar. Now, a couple of days ago, I was talking about how Rodlic is, is essentially guiding Pogacar to the line, just, just checking him, making sure he doesn't do anything stupid, helping him pull away from the rest of the riders. But I don't know if that's the case anymore. Because if Pogacar can just take a few more seconds out of Rodlic at some of these bonuses... We're in for a serious fight when it gets to that time trial because Pogacar on paper would be the better time trialist, but this is not an in, it's not a typical individual time trial. This is a, this is a hill climb. Aerodynamics aren't going to play a huge part in this one compared to a, a typical time trial. So how is it going to play out? Who's the better hill climber? Who's the strongest coming into that final stage prior to them heading into Paris? And if it's around 10, 20 seconds, well, even if it stays as it is now, do we think that the youngster can go out there, bury himself to bits, and potentially beat Rodlich? Next up, let's finish off with this discussion point, right? Stage 15. 16 kilometres the Grand Colombier was. <sighs> Team Jumbo Visma didn't start using their climbers, their out and out climbers until eight kilometers to go. Essentially, Wout van Aert took that team from the base of that climb to eight kilometers to go on his own, and in doing so, dropping Nairo Quintana, dropping the current Tour de France winner, Egan Bernal, and along with that, a whole host of other climbing talent and GC contenders. Now, I hate using the word unbelievable for someone like Wout van Aert, but his performance yesterday was something else. It was, it was just... I just don't get it. We've got a rider here who's clearly, clearly talented, right? But how many hats has this man worn for this Tour de France? One day, he's sprinting with the world's best sprinters fighting for victory. The next day, he's protecting his GC rider from the crosswinds. And then Sunday, he sat on the front, dropping some of the world's best climbers. I mean, it just, it's on. Jumbo Visma didn't start using their climbers and that they didn't even use them all up in the end, but they didn't start using their out and out climbers till eight kilometers to go of the Grand Colombia. Now, had that been Team Ineos, would we have seen a different dynamic there? Would we have seen them say to Wout van Aert, go harder, push harder, and use all their riders up a lot earlier? Or was it the fact that the pace wasn't that hard for Wout van Aert, and yet they were still dropping riders, that they said to him, if you're comfortable with that pace, keep going at that pace. No one's able to attack. In fact, the only rider to even try and attack was Simon Yates. But at the same time, you can't help thinking, if Wout van Aert's on the front, the pace for the climbers isn't full gas yet. But even when George Bennett got on the front, it didn't go to full gas. Even when Tom Dumoulin got on the front, it didn't go full gas. And it didn't even really go full gas until Tajit Pogacar 
and Primoz Rodlich started to fight for that victory. Clearly, the rider who had the easiest day out of everybody on Sunday was Sepp Kuss. He sat behind Primoz Rodlich. Bear in mind, this guy is there just to bury himself for this man. And he didn't even have to. Imagine how much fresher Sepp Kuss is now because he didn't have to put an effort in. So let me pass the question off to you. How is Wout Van Aert able to be so bloody good? And I'm, this this is not a, do you think he's on drugs or not? Just a, how, how in like this day and age when there's so many people specialising in so many different avenues of racing, i.e. your sprinters, your flat riders, your classics riders, your GC riders, have we got someone here who's pretty much capable of doing it all. Similar like we said earlier to Remco Evenepoel, Mathieu van der Poel. Do you think these type of riders that are coming through now are going to be the new era of cyclists that that can go to a few classics races and win them, head into winter season, go and race a bit of cyclocross, win all that, do a bit of mountain biking, come back, win the Tour de France, win the World Championships, win a couple of spring classics and can just do it all. You know, similar to you, you look at like Eddie Merckx back, back in the day. There was nothing that that man couldn't do. Do you think we're seeing in Wout van Aert, Remco Evenepoel, Mathieu van der Poel, people like that, that, that these riders are now the new era of, of cyclists and we're going to see less people concentrating solely on going for GC, on going for that polka dot jersey, on going for that green jersey, on trying to win spring classics. I don't know, but it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on it because it baffles me, man. And there we go, we're pretty much back up to speed with everything that's going off in the world of cycling. Make sure if you're not done already, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you're not enjoying the video for whatever reason, hit that dislike button and leave your comments down below. We've got an exciting week of racing coming up at the Tour de France. Can Pogacar beat Rodlich? Who's going to make it onto the third step? I know I said I didn't care, but now it's getting a bit interesting. The race essentially is first and second against each other, the rest of them for that third spot. So it's going to be an amazing dynamic to see what happens with this race heading into the final week. Leave all your comments down below. Thanks for watching. Aish.